Hello, I'm Laura Shavin, and this is the Offcuts Draw. Welcome to the Offcuts Draw, the show that looks inside a writer's bottom drawer to find the bits of work they never finished, had rejected, or couldn't quite find a home for. We bring them to life, hear the stories behind them, and learn how these random pieces of creativity paved the way to subsequent success. My guest this week is writer, comedian and actress Catherine Jakeways. As a writer, she rose to prominence with her first radio series, North by Northamptonshire, a gentle award-nominated comedy drama with an all-star cast that ran for three series on Radio 4. She went on to create and write three series of All Those Women for Radio 4, one series of Guilt Trip, various other single works, and her radio play, Where This Service Will Terminate, was so popular it was extended to include another four instalments of the story. If you recognise her voice, it could be from her appearance in countless TV comedies, including Outnumbered, Mid-Morning Matters with Alan Partridge and Tracy Ullman's show, which she also wrote on, or from the recent Horrible Histories film where she played the lead character's mum. Catherine Jakeways, welcome to the Offcuts Draw. Hello, thank you for having me. Thank you very much. That's a nice intro. I, I was relieved that you kept going because it sounded a bit like you were going to say that you were looking inside a writer's bottom. So I was was glad it was the writer's bottom job. I was relieved. No, no, no. That's not this kind of programme. No, no, no. Good. Well, thanks for having me. Now, do you need to have anything around you when you write? Um, It might be more about what I don't have around me, which is mainly my children. If they're (laughs) they're in the house, it's it's much harder to write. So, uh, yeah, an empty house is ideal. And I can't have any, much to my husband's annoyance often, actually, I can't write at all if there's a a radio on or if there's even any music on. I know I think some writers quite like to have a bit of music on, but I quite like it to be silent because I very Mm. often speak lines aloud to myself or sort of under my breath and and talk to myself. Right. And I think even having music on, I think, does interrupt the rhythm of of speech, actually. Yeah. Okay, let's kick off with your first off cut. Can you tell us what it's called, what genre it was written for and when it was written? Uh, sure. It's a excerpt from the first draft of my radio series, North by Northamptonshire. Um, and we did the first series in 2007. So it's around then. Thanks, Martin. Gosh, it looks lovely and warm in that studio. <laughs> well, that's right. I'm out and about, as usual, continuing my mission to bring you the very best in entertainment around the region this weekend. Now, I spent last Sunday at my favourite of the region's tourist attractions, India Alive. I don't know if you've been to India Alive. It's where you can experience the sights, sounds and smells of the subcontinent, five minutes south of Lowestoft on the A12. You can generally sum up India Alive in three words. Needs a gift shop. However, I spent a wonderful afternoon there on Saturday with my friend Maxine and they really looked after us. I didn't realise you could put chicken nuggets into a chapati, but with ketchup it really works. And it takes your mind off the stench of goats and joysticks. But this weekend, I'm suggesting you take a trip to Waddenhoe, where, behind me, rehearsals are already well underway for their annual show and tell night. Local people are invited to come along and show their friends and neighbours something and then tell them what it's all about. So it should be a lot of fun. Already I'm hearing rumours of some doggy dancing, a collection of autographs from some of the region's best love radio DJs and a very unusual birthmark. But I came along to this event last year and it was an absolute hoot. I, for one, will struggle to forget local man Alf Raymond's country and western body popping, I can tell you. But a good time is guaranteed for all. And you know me, I really like having a good time. I'm a bit funny like that. I also really like nice people and kind people. Not so keen on paedophiles. Back to you in the studio, Martin. This character was called Penny, according to the script you sent us. Um, Tell us about this character. Did she stay in the series? Did she change much? I think she was from a very early version of the script uh, because North by Northampton just started as a a show that I'd done as a stage show, a one-woman show that I did um, in Soho Theatre in London, um, which was... Uh, just me playing lots of different characters in a village hall. It was sort of, I think it was called the village hall, not very originally. And yeah, I played various characters, women, men, children, um, but it was just me on stage. And one of them was this character who was a local news reporter. So she was slightly based, I mean, actually she was based on every local news reporter ever, 
Um, and actually, when it came to it, we we ended up cutting it because I think it started out with North by Northamptonshire being a bit of a sketch show. We were sort of working it out. It was the first thing that I'd ever written in terms of a radio thing. Um, so I'd only ever done monologues on, on stage. And so when it was uh suggested that I turn it into something for the radio I was very much sort of making it up as I went along and feeling my way into whether it was going to be a sketch show or, or a narrative thing or a sort of sitcom mm-hmm. sort of ended up being none of those really it was a comedy it was drama narrative, I suppose wasn't it? it was na- it was certainly narrative but it wasn't really a sitcom mm. um, but to begin with I think I wasn't sure whether it might end up being a bit more sketchy and if it had have been then I think this character Penny Bundock would have been much more part of it I think that in the f- fourth episode the final episode of the first series I believe that I did actually do this character but only once as a one-off thing but I had uh yeah I'd sort of assumed that I would play more parts in North Carolina than I ended up playing how many did you end up playing in the end um I was two and then the news reporter in the last episode but I did less and less as time went on actually it started out as a sort of I sort of had done it on stage as a vehicle for me as an actor and then the poor producer had to have an awkward conversation with me where she said you know on radio you can't really play every single character including the men and the children (laughs) because it just won't come across Mm. Um, I guess if it was a bit more sketchy then I could have done that a little bit more but as it turned out we had such brilliant people in it anyway Mm. Um, and I sort of created this wish list of people uh, actors that I would have liked to have played the parts you know in an ideal world and then we got I think every single person that we asked said yes to it extraordinarily. And I didn't realise at the time how unusual that was or how lucky we were to get people. It must have just caught people on a good day, I guess. But it was, Mm. um, yeah, so um, Penny was um, a character that I'd done on stage and had had been pleased with. And it was interesting. It's it's funny now when I listen back to the first series of Ev North by Northamptonshire because it's, it's really obvious to me that there are, particularly in the first episode, the pilot that we did, there are whole sections which really only exist in the radio version because they were versions of a monologue that I'd done on stage that I'd struggled to sort of mould into being scenes. And I wasn't really very good at writing scenes with more than one person in them. I just didn't have any experience of that because all the writing I'd done had been monologues for myself on stage. So I hadn't done any sort of two-handers or, you know, more Mm. than that. And although, you know, I'm really proud of the first series, but it does get better as it goes along. And um, I had a lot of help with sort of how you structure a radio series and how you sort of develop characters. And so by the time it gets to the third series, and then there was a finale that we did at the end, but particularly the third series, actually, I am really proud of it when I look back on it. I think it's one of the best, you know, it's a bit hard when something you've done early is one of your things that you're proudest <laughs> of because you're always all struggling to get it to be as good as that. But, and actually, I do think one of the keys to it, and this was entirely accidental, was that I'm not a big listener to Radio 4. Mm. Um, I wasn't before, and I don't listen to loads of Radio 4 comedy now, which yeah. is terrible, isn't it? No. Maybe, I don't know whether I'm happy to have that said in public, but it's true. And and so I don't think I sort of knew what Radio 4 comedy sounded like. So I, what I wrote with North Bone of Hampshire was sort of a version of something that I thought I'd like to hear. Mm. And actually, as time's gone on, it's very hard not to sort of fall into doing, oh, this is how a Radio 4 comedy sounds, and this is the rhythms of, of the way a scene works. And often that's brilliant, mm. but there can be times where it feels a little bit like you're copying the way other people have done it. And I think if there was a success to North Bottom of Hampshire, it was slightly accidentally that I had written something that didn't sound like other stuff on Radio 4 necessarily at the time. Right, time for another off-cut. What might this one be? Oh, this, I'm slightly embarrassed about this. This is a short poem that I wrote. You'll be glad that it's short uh, when you hear it. When I was a teenager. Is it worth the pain and sorrow... The thinking, well, he'll call tomorrow. The listening to my friends insist that he does know I exist. He never writes. He never calls. He never thinks of me at all. Why is it then that as before, with every day, I love him more? So how old were you when you wrote this? Dear, Uh, I think I would have been about 14. Right. uh, Probably. Was it Love's Young Dream? It wasn't. Um, I think I thought it was. It was entirely unrequited, as the poem suggests. (laughs) Um, I'd been on a um, summer, it was a week-long residential sort of thing, which 
was like a PGL holiday, you know, when you go and do sort of orienteering and mm. um, canoeing and stuff like that, except it wasn't. It was a slightly sort of lesser version of that, which was sort of supposed to be sports. And I went just for a week and we did sort of like tennis and netball and dicking about and got given <laughs> meals and had a disco. And, you know, it was it was just a way of your parents going, would it be for a week probably? But now I realise mm. now, now I'm a parent myself. Um, but I loved it. And there was a group of boys who I went to a normal, completely normal comprehensive uh, school in Northamptonshire but there was Mixed. a group yeah so I, mm. I wasn't hugely excited about seeing boys but it was the fact that these boys were from a boarding school and they seemed like the kind of boys that you'd see on telly that they were sort of big there was this this one in particular who I wrote this poem about whose name let's call him Tim um <laughs> so coy let's call him Tim <laughs> yeah let's call him Tim he he was tall and sort of broad-shouldered and it was sort of like a slow motion scene, like they just sort of appeared in this sports hall and they right. all walked in and they were all quite sort of, you know, high and floppy haired and a bit sort of Hugh Grant, but bigger and um, rugby shirts. I mean, it actually sounds horrific now and I'm actually quite no, embarrassed. It doesn't. Embarrassed by my 14 year old self for having any interest in that, but um, they weren't like boys that I'd ever met before. Anyway, we had a week of this sort of, you know, chatting and flirting and in a 14 year old awful way. Nothing happened at all, but we did exchange addresses because, of course, it was long before, thank God, long before mobile phones or social media or anything like that. So there was no, I'll text you or I'll WhatsApp you or whatever you would do now. Snapchat, listen to me like, someone's grand <laughs> so thank god I, don't you always think thank god I wasn't a teenager and that wasn't an option to me that I could have tweeted oh, somebody yes. or done something publicly because oh yes. my god I just would have been the most horrific as that poem demonstrates I would you know <laughs> the stuff that when you're a teenager that you you know I remember having some boy's phone number and and just so thrilling to even have his landline number but the idea that you could actually just, you know, send people messages and put things publicly and on their mm. walls or whatever. No, you had to just tell your best friend about it over the phone for about five hours. Exactly. So yeah. my poor friend Ruth would have heard endlessly about this this guy. Anyway, so I came back from the holiday with all the addresses at boarding school of all these boys. And this one in particular, I wrote to several times. I'd, I'd, I'd like to think I didn't bombard him with letters but certainly I wrote him enough letters that I expected to get a reply and just never got a reply and I remember there being weeks and weeks where every day when I got back from school I'd be checking for the post to see if there was a letter from him and there wasn't and so that poem which I never actually I believe wrote down so this is now 30 years on I have remembered that poem in my head and your um, heart and my very much my heart <laughs> and um <laughs> I never considered myself to be, and that poem demonstrates why, you know, I never did much writing at all, really, until I was I was going to ask you about your school performance. Were you academic? Were you somebody always very creative in English lessons? And I was quite, I did okay at school. Yeah, like I say, it was just a normal comprehensive school. But no, I did well. I did quite, you know, I worked reasonably hard and I always liked English and I always sort of liked drama and I wanted to be an actor and I never considered being a writer. Although my granny did say to me when I was younger and I I remember this specifically that she said she thought I would end up being a writer and it was baffling to me because it never occurred to me that I would write but um and really? I never I didn't have any interest in it for another 20 years really but she she had obviously thought that that might be something I'd be I'd be good at and I think um obviously your thank you letters for the money that you were sent to your <laughs> birthday must have been particularly interesting well let's have your next off cut now which is this what's this one called uh right so this is a monologue I think it may be pretty much the first monologue I ever wrote was certainly one of the first. She was called Janet, the character, and I wrote it for... It ultimately ended up being in my first Edinburgh show in 2003. The first time me and Graham had sex with each other, he told me my pubes were unruly. He said to me, what do you call that down there, Leo Sayer? And I said, no, not really. He's been my boyfriend for about 18 months, but to be honest, he's a complete bastard. I did think at one stage that he might not be a bastard, but he was a bastard. It had got to the stage when I'd say we were rowing between 23 and 24-7, and he was phoning me up specifically to have a go at me. And then we had this weekend about a month ago, when we had a right laugh and shagged a lot. <laughs> he sang to me. Yeah, he did. He's quite good, actually. Karaoke he does. And he was singing Wake Up Maggie, which I really like because my mum's name was Amanda and it reminds me of her. 
Anyway, this holiday we planned that weekend. It was a package out of Manchester and our flight was packed full. By the time we got on the plane, me and Graham weren't speaking and my kids, Carl and Haley were hitting each other with the free colouring books and stuffing the paper sick bags down each other's underpants. Graham's useless in that sort of situation. On the last night of the hotel, they had a talent contest for the kids. You know, the stupid entertainments team organised it. And all these fucking kids were belting out like a virgin and doing all the dance routines for Hit Me Baby One More Time. You can imagine. Some of them had been practising all week. They knew all the moves, you know. So when my Haley got up proudly onto the stage and announced she was going to do her impression of a camel... This one ends rather abruptly. Oh, um, yeah. What happens at the end of this? <laughs> or is there a piece missing? Is it? I is wonder it some... if I sent you the wrong bit of it or something or didn't include the end when I sent it to you. But anyway, it's probably no bad thing. You get the gist anyway. Yeah. Basically, it was a... When I left drama school, I did some acting jobs, not massively successfully for several years. And one of the acting jobs I did about three years after I left drama school was a production, oddly, of Hamlet... And the director at the time, as a rehearsal exercise, encouraged us to write some monologues based on newspaper articles. So he came in to the rehearsal room with a big pile of newspapers, different newspapers from that day, and sort of chucked them on the table and said, pick a newspaper and find a story that's interesting to you and write in the first person a monologue as if you are one of the characters in that newspaper article. I think it was a an Indian rehearsal technique an acting Indian rehearsal technique and the guy was called John Russell Brown who's a really lovely man I think he was probably in his certainly late 70s if not 80s at the time and I'm afraid to say he's no longer with us but he he was I didn't know at the time what a massive change in my life he was going to bring about but he did accidentally by encouraging us to do to write these monologues and this was a story that was in the newspaper at the time about this woman who'd been on holiday And uh, you didn't get much detail about actually what had happened on the holiday, but the article was about the fact that she'd come back on the plane from wherever it was she'd been to to Manchester Airport and she'd got pissed on the plane and had ended up shouting uh, like a big sort of tirade at all these passengers and the police had been there to meet her when she got back to Manchester Airport and she'd been arrested. And so I had written this monologue um, as if I was this woman, Janet, who I got don't know, no idea if that was actually a real name. It may have been. So I tried to make it slightly more sympathetic that she'd been on this holiday and she'd had this terrible time on holiday and her kids had had the piss taken out of them and she'd been away with this boyfriend who wasn't very nice to her. And there'd been a sort of sequence of events which had made her angry and got her, um, you know, het up and the whole sort of holiday thing of being hot anyway and just the, the sort of pressure cooker of it all. And then on the plane on the way home, she'd had a few drinks. And so as part of the monologue, she got angrier and angrier and angrier. And then the last sort of minute of the monologue was her just doing this big tirade at the audience. I mean, in retrospect, I don't know how this must have gone down in the comedy clubs of uh, South London, which is where I did end up performing it. It was I, I used to really enjoy doing it. And it was it started out as this rehearsal exercise. And then a group of us, because we were, had written these monologues that had um, you were all really enjoyed you from doing. the same production from, from the, the same production of Hamlet yeah mm. we were all friends who'd been at Lambda together actually so several of them are, are really good friends of mine to this day and we enjoyed doing it and several people had said oh you know what you should see if you could do that as a sort of comedy show so we put together this I think it was called Beyond the News and it was five or six of us doing these monologues and the idea was that each week we would come up with something that had been in the news that week. And so it was vaguely topical, although they were all sort of small stories like this. They were character exercises, though, character monologues. Exactly that, yeah. So, Mm -hmm. And then we did them in various comedy clubs in Finsbury Park or in Crouch End or I think there was a Brixton one. And we did it in various places. And as a result of that, some of them didn't enjoy doing it as much as I did, but it was something that I really liked. And I got seen by an agent, a really brilliant and lovely comedy agent called Lisa White, who took me on on the basis of that and then encouraged me to do more comedy and which I hadn't done uh, any of that kind of thing up till that stage and I hadn't done any writing so it was sort of the beginning of me doing any writing or comedy which led to me going to Edinburgh in 2003 which was my first Edinburgh show and that character Janet ended up being the sort of finale of the Edinburgh show and and it's when I look back on it now because I don't do any live performance stuff now really and I haven't for years I'm sort of baffled by how fearless I was at the time because I was sort of mid-twenties and I was I used to go off in my car and drive to wherever these places were in London which I didn't even particularly know London that well and just turn up and it would be mainly almost entirely blokes obviously on the Mm. comedy club bill 
and there would be a bill of, of stand-ups. There would be women as well, obviously, but it was, you know, fewer. Mm. And then I was often the only character act. I don't know. I would hate now to see a sort of video of me doing it. But actually, I'm quite proud of my 25-year-old self for having the balls to do it, really. And to, you know, yeah. sometimes it went down really well. There were certainly nights, and I remember one particular night where it, it didn't go down well at all, and I tried to climb out of the toilet window afterwards because I couldn't face going back through the pub to leave through the audience. Um, and so, yeah, I did. So I did that for a couple of years before I went to Edinburgh. And then in Edinburgh, actually, when my first Edinburgh show was, I think, successful by, yeah, most standards. You know, I had really good, nice reviews and we mm. sold some tickets. And it was a, the beginning of, of everything then that sort of came after. And I got all, all the acting work, the telly stuff that I did around then was all based on, on Edinburgh. It, it went well and it felt like... The start of something new because I, you know it's sort of the end of me being a unsuccessful actress and just the start of me being able to think of myself as a writer I suppose and things started to change. Right time for another off cut what might this one be? Uh, okay this is skipping later in time actually and this is from a tv pilot script that I wrote only a couple of years ago sort of 2018-19 and it's called You Never Know. Interior, Heathrow Airport Arrivals Area. Joe arrives through the arrivals door, wheeling a large suitcase and carrying a suit carrier. Mary offers up her sign, eyebrows raised. Joe smiles and changes course towards her. Well, will you look at that? Like I'm some kind of dignitary. Sorry about the exclamation, Mark. It suddenly felt a bit... I'm Mary. She goes to shake hands. Joe kisses her on the cheek. Laura's mom. That's it. Uh, do we do... Both? Or or is that the French? The French do all sorts of kissing. (laughs) You're here! Yeah, I'm all set. And Mary, it's a pleasure. Likewise. Well, we'll be... won't we? Very soon. Family? Now, you must be exhausted. Let me... She tries to take his suitcase. No, no. You know what? Look at those wheels. She just glides like a swan and uh, the two of us have got a little thing going. There's eye contact and Mary's flustered all over again. So now what? uh, We... I take you home and we can... wedding. (laughs) Oh yeah, how about that? Let's go have a wedding. Mary gestures to the exit and they head towards it. Cut to interior Heathrow Airport arrivals area. Mary is leading Joe through the airport. And it's your first time in England? Very first. Well, it must all seem very... No queen. Where is she? She'll be along to say hello any minute, I bet. Oh, she'll be here for sure. Plus, Judy Dench. Uh, David Beckham. And, oh, struggling to think of someone else you'd know. Uh, Trevor MacDonald? No idea. Uh, David Attenborough. Of course. (laughs) With his little monkeys and and his uh, nature. So, is your car... uh... Oh, I I don't drive. I mean, I'm learning. Uh I've been learning for a decade. Long story. But no, I've come on the train. I'm no expert on the tube, but I looked it all up and it's quite straightforward. Just dark blue line all the way to St Pancras. So, easy peasy. And not crowded. Cut to interior tube carriage Piccadilly line in rush hour. Mary and Joe are sitting, crushed together on a crowded commuter tube. I mean, obviously now it's quite crowded, although compared to New York, I expect it's nothing. No, no, this is kind of sudden. Upholstered seats. Well, the Queen insists on it. I bet she does. I bet she does. Anyway, your B&B's very nice, I hope. It's got four stars, so you'll be able to, before everything kicks off, the full calendar of events... I saw the agenda. I like it. We know where we stand. Oh, good. Because Laura thought I was being... But I wanted to. Joe puts a reassuring hand on Mary's hand. You plan. You're a planner. Mary's taken aback by the hand. But she's grateful for it. So where did you get the idea from for this project? Um, I think it was based on the idea that wouldn't it be interesting if there was a young couple who were getting married. I think I started out as being a film idea, actually, it did. A sort of rom-com about a young couple who were getting married and you were slightly wrong-footed into believing that the story was going to be about this young couple. And actually, wouldn't it be interesting if it turned out that the story was about 
the bride's mother and the groom's father. So it's a originally a film idea which grew into an idea for a television series and actually potentially could still be either. So I've sort of got versions of it in my head which could go either way. But it's, yeah, so it's a story about an American boy and an English girl who are sort of late 20s and they are getting married and the scene that you just heard was the mother of the bride and the father of the groom and she's picked him up at the airport in order Mm. to take him for the wedding I mean it's the first time they've met and so then they start having this sort of um connection and they're both single and that's you know obviously it's a little bit weird because her daughter's marrying his son but that's you know They've so met the for the first time. Stuff sitcoms are made of, I believe. Well, what, wasn't there one with uh, Lizette Anthony, Two Up, Three Down, or something oh, like yeah, that? Oh, yeah, that was good, wasn't it? With Michael Elphick. That's right. I don't remember if it was good. I just remember it being there. Well, I, I liked it at the time, but I, all of my memories of sitcoms around that time was that I really liked them <laughs> because I think I just <laughs> liked comedies. So whenever anybody mentions a sitcom from the 80s, I go, oh, that was brilliant. And then right. you rewatch it and go, it wasn't necessarily, but I loved it at the time. Yeah. So, But then the idea with this is what happens is that the two of them have this couple of days in the run-up to the wedding where they form this connection and nothing happens, but they clearly, you know, sort of like each other and feel romantically involved with each other in a sort of fearful way. But then on the day before the wedding, her daughter uh, announces that she doesn't actually want to marry the son. So the wedding is called off in a very dramatic way. And there's a big sort of row and big fallout and lots of people say things that they can't take back. And of course, it's very sad for the young couple who were supposed to be getting married. But what we really care about is it's also really sad for Mary and Joe, who are the parents who mm. have, you know, their children now hate each other and have ruined each other's lives. So mm. it's it's a sort of classic starting point for me, really, which is of a slightly lonely woman of a certain age, which seems to be who I've written about since I was certainly not a lonely woman of a certain age. And now I'm approaching that, although less lonely, hopefully, but certainly approaching that age a bit more now. But it always seems to be my safe area is sort of women in their 50s and 60s. Why do you um, think that is? I don't know. I mean, I honestly don't know. And I've wondered. I mean, I guess my mum is the obvious sort of benchmark for it, although she's not really like these women. But she's certainly not lonely. She's been married to my dad for 52 years or something, and they're still very happily married. But she's, I don't know. I'm an only child. And I don't. I, it's only fairly recently that it occurred to me that that might be quite relevant to the fact that I have ended up being a writer, because I do think that as a an only child in a house when you're growing up you listen much more to what your parents are saying just inevitably because they're the ones talking more than you are Mm. so I think I quite often as a child used to sort of be involved in grown-up conversations in a way that I don't think my children are always because there's two of them and so when we're sitting around a dinner table it's mainly about the kids and Mm. they'll be chatting about school or whatever and we'll be asking them questions and of course we talk but if we're talking me and my husband then the kids are probably not really listening because they're talking to each other Mm. so I think there's less listening that goes on in a family when there's more than one child and so I sort of have always slightly assumed that maybe I have got that from my mum Hi, this is Laura. Sorry to interrupt, but if you're enjoying the show, please do subscribe to the Off Cuts Draw. Give us a five-star rating, leave a review, tell your friends about it. All that stuff's really important for a brand new podcast like this. And visit offcutsdraw.com for more details about the writers and actors and to find out about future live shows. Thanks for your support. Now back to the interview. My mum's also, she's brilliant, my mum. She's very funny and she's very bright and she's great. But she's all, she does that classic thing, which I know I do, which is slightly apologise for herself all the time. And it's such a sort of English thing and such a generational, I, I like to think, I hope that girls do it less now, actually. I think they do as, you know, mm. younger girls probably are less likely to do it. But certainly that generation of my mum's generation, and probably my generation, do have that sort of apologetic slightly come into a room expecting people to criticise them. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I think yeah. that that's... Uh, well, it's politeness, isn't it? It's, it it's is. Sort it's, of, yeah, you... the, the good version of that is that it's politeness and it's just an English way of... Yes, God forbid you should be seen to be boastful or... or... Yeah, worst case scenario that somebody would think you were showing off. Yes, it's a very unfeminine, unattractive British thing. Absolutely. Mm. And I mean, men do it all the time. And, and Americans, do, you know, stereotypically, I'm sure this isn't the case for all Americans and it's not the case for all English people, but the stereotype of Americans, and you always hear that when people are pitching TV shows in America, they go in and go, this is going to be the best 
goddamn show you've ever seen. And, you know, they will immediately just say, I am great. And this is why I'm funny. And this is why you should think this is brilliant. And of course, it's a great quality to have. Because mm. when someone says that to you, if they're saying it in the right way, then you do sort of believe them. Whereas the sort of stereotype of an English, particularly woman, mm. <laughs> is to go, well, I'm so sorry. Well, this will probably be rubbish, but anyway, I'll tell you it anyway. And then we'll all <laughs> go off and forget about it and do something else. And I'm yeah. so sorry to waste your time. Um, so true. We all, we're all a bit like that. I mean, I'm never going to iron that out entirely. But I think my mum is like that. And I do think that's something that I guess influenced me or that I noticed the way that she is and the way that a lot of women of her age are. And so I think that's my default character is that kind of person so the mary in in the clip that we just heard is like that but also i mean you can point to a lot of characters in in the stuff that i've done who are like that and the where this service will terminate which you mentioned in your introduction Mm. is the sort of purest version of my other big theme i always come back to which is slightly longing to escape and longing to sort of slightly break out of your life which i guess is something that happens at that age as well and in well, in where this service will terminate, it's it's a woman who is in a in a reasonably sort of normal marriage, not a particularly unhappy marriage, but just a slightly dull marriage. And she meets somebody on a train journey who who she forms a connection with. And I'm really interested in that kind of moment of of meeting and that sort of. I don't think I necessarily buy into love at first sight, but certainly I, you know, there's a connection that you can feel with somebody, whether it's a romantic connection or a, or, you know, completely platonic connection that sometimes you just meet somebody and you just go, oh God, I really like you. And there's something about you that's really interesting. And you're interested in me and you're making me feel a certain way about myself that I haven't noticed before. And that, like I said, I don't think that necessarily has to be a romantic link. You can quite often, you know, it's really thrilling when you meet somebody, you think, oh, I really think we're going to end up being good mates. And it doesn't happen very often, does it? But there's, Mm. you know, sometimes you do think that. So I think that with Where This Service, that was what was the starting point of that very much, that they were sitting next to each other on this endless train journey from London to Penzance. And they felt like that about each other. But also with this, with You Never Know, I wanted there to be that immediate spark and sort of connection between Mary and Joe when she picks him up at the airport and then Mm. it can go anywhere from that and actually it could end up that you're disappointed and you were wrong but it's just an interesting thought as a starting point but it's one that I've used quite a lot. Let's move on to your next off cut and this one is... Ah, no, this is, uh, oh, this is terrible. This is a proposal. <laughs> Don't say for, that. Uh, no, but this really is. I mean, some of the things are quite good. The last one, you never know, I was very proud of that. Let's just yeah. be, let's be upfront about that. And I'm not going to apologise for that because I am very proud of that. And I think it's great. This is mm. less great, but it's a proposal for a 13 part sitcom for a CBBC. Children's TV channel. Yeah, children's show, uh, which I wrote in 2013. And it's called The Magical Mirror of Magic. In Priorwood Park School, Just near the caretaker's cupboard, on the corridor where you queue up for lunch and try not to get told off for mucking about, there's a cloakroom. And just off the cloakroom, there are children's toilets. And in the toilets, as well as the three cubicles containing oddly low loos and the basins with soap dispensers which usually don't work, there's a mirror. It's the end mirror, the one above the basin in the corner that you wouldn't normally go to. And the mirror has got a crack in it which, as far as anyone knows, has been there since the school was built. Nobody knows, but it's a magic mirror. When anyone looks into it and makes a wish, and you'd be surprised how often that happens, the wish comes true. Nobody knows why, but there are often strange goings on at Priorwood Park. When Josh Leesons was told off twice in one morning by two different teachers, he happened to wish, while washing his hands, that just for one day his whole class could be teachers and his teachers could be pupils. See how they like it. And they did see. And they didn't like it. When Stacey Maloney noticed that Miss Cohen, the PE teacher, was looking a bit lonely, she couldn't help but wish that Mr Friedman, the art teacher, might notice too and ask her to marry him. Much to Miss Cohen's surprise, during afternoon break, he did. Sophie Hernandez wished to be a princess. Claire Rowell wished her brother would get lost. Fergus Green wished he was a caveman when he found out that they didn't eat vegetables. George Bradbury's mum wished that while she was at parents' evening, Miss Harewood would tell her George was better behaved than the son of her next-door neighbour. Mrs Fisham, the head teacher, wished that the school wasn't so scruffy and simply couldn't believe how much less scruffy it became. Ben Irving wished that he could get his own back on Spencer Norman and his gang. Evie and Maggie wished that they didn't have to do their maths test, even if it meant aliens landing in the playground. 
When the bell rings for the end of school, all the weird goings-on at Priorwood are over and everything goes back to normal. But often, lessons have been learned. And if not, often someone had fallen over and landed headfirst in a bucket. So this was written for children's TV. Now, you've worked a lot with the Horrible Histories team. Uh, you were in the movie, as I mentioned, playing quite a big part. Yes, thanks. Did you ever write on Horrible Histories or were you just actress? I did the odd sketch for Horrible Histories. I'm very much not one of their regular writing team and I was never one of their regular performing team. I was sort of part of it because I knew the people involved quite well and all of the actors in it were people that I'd started out with like we were saying sort of at the Hen and Chickens and Jim Howick and um, Ben Wilbond and people that I'd known uh, for years really and we'd done a lot of sort of live stuff there was used to be a thing called Ealing Live which was an early character comedy night that they did at Ealing Film Studios in in West London it was so exciting at the time and so much fun and so sort of important actually in retrospect for the people who came out of it so I you know I'm in a handful of, of the sketches and I wrote on a handful of them. I mean, I'm thrilled to be even any part of it now because particularly when you have kids, you suddenly realise what an amazing God. I, I was going to ask you, have you ever written anything with a view to your kids being able to either read it or watch it on television to get extra kudos points for mummy uh, being cool? Well, I, that, they've got no interest at all in me being cool. In fact, they're now of an age where me being cool is the worst case scenario. You know, they <laughs> would hate the thought of me. Trying to be cool, but yeah, when I when you have young kids, you do get a bit more interested in children's television because you, of course, you have a period in your life where it's the main thing that you're watching, yeah. and you see the CBBS years, and then you grow into the sort of CBBC stuff, and some of it's brilliant, like horrible histories, and some of it's less good. And yeah, if you're a writer, if you're involved in that world in any way, inevitably you're going to go, oh, I reckon I could have a go at that. And I did do some writing actually in the early days of me trying to get into telly I did a couple of episodes of some some children's tv shows I did there's a show called Go Jetters your kids are older than um yes mine I've I've heard of Go Jetters I've seen it it it, it was quite a big deal I think maybe it is still quite a big deal my kids are too old for that now but I gather I think it is still quite a big deal I had a couple of episodes of that oh and there was a a thing that was um fun called the Furchester Hotel which was a lot of the uh, Muppets characters and stuff (gasps) so not no not actually the Muppets the Sesame Street God, isn't it awful? I'm not quite sure of the difference and I would have known at the time. But anyway, it was puppets. So I did. I you sort wrote of, them or you were in them? I wrote them. Right. So I had a couple of years where I was on a list of names that people would come to for doing children's TV. And when you get on one of those lists, particularly if you're a woman, actually, because <laughs> a lot of them are blokes, you do get asked to do other stuff. So I quite often got asked to do for a while episodes of kids TV shows. And In the end, I had to sort of start saying no to it because, like I say, it snowballs. And once you've been asked to do that kind of thing, you just become one of the people that gets asked to do all the new ones. So I I could have gone on and and done a lot more of that, but it wasn't quite where I wanted my... Career to no middle aged women who could who no apologised all the women. time. No, or well, there would have been if I had ever got my own um, children's series. Would have ended up being about a lonely middle aged woman <laughs> on an island somewhere, longing to get off the island and a load of kids and puppets and stuff around it. Which actually, I might write that down. It's quite a good idea. Um, but. The proposal that you just heard, I included that partly because it was an amusing thing that I had woke up in the middle of the night once years ago. And, you know, sometimes when you're a writer or anybody, I think you sort of wake up in the night and go, I've just had a brilliant idea and I've got to write it down. And you write it down and then in the morning you look back at it and think, God, what the hell was that? Well, I had done this and thought I've really nailed it here. I've had a really brilliant idea. And I woke up and all it said on my notes bit of my phone was the magical mirror of magic. And that was all. And it was in my head. This was a fully formed sort of brilliant you were accepting the awards yeah (laughs) I was absolutely picking the frog and then later on I was asked by a children's producer to come up with a a proposal for a children's show so this the magical mirror of magic the (laughs) proposal never went anywhere beyond it being sent back and forth between me and a producer once or twice I think I don't think it ever even got shown to a commissioner or anything like that but it's a useful example I thought of just how many of these things that as a writer you end up writing and it almost becomes an art form in itself it's like a whole different skill in some ways from writing a tv show or writing a script is writing these bloody proposals which you end up doing so many of and you sort of write them in your sleep and it's it's funny when you hear them back and it's things like and then something really interesting happens because clearly you haven't thought of what the interesting thing is going to be but you have to sort of tease the fact that you've got lots of other good ideas and then and then there might be some learning that goes on and then they really learn a few things about themselves or then something really surprising happens and you don't actually know what these things are but you're having to tease to the commissioner that the 
there will be some good ideas that you'll have at sure. some time in the future if they give you some money for it. But like I said, I don't think a commissioner ever even laid eyes on it. But maybe one day they will see it and go, hang on. Mm. We're really after some kind of magical mirror type show, <laughs> ideally with some extra magic thrown in. <laughs> yeah, maybe that will make my fortune one day, but so far not yet. Fabulous. <laughs> well, time for your final off cut now. Can you tell us what it is? So this is from a, a pilot for a TV show that I made uh, for the BBC and in, I think, about uh, 2018, and it's called Carol and Vinny. Interior, Carol's house. Carol, her dad Derek and his girlfriend Jackie are whispering in the kitchen. Through the door we can see Carol's nephew Vinny watching telly in the living room. Carol's anxious, wiping surfaces and putting her coat on. We wondered why Bev had turned up when nobody had died. You're a soft touch, Carol. You've always been the same. I'm going to get a few bits. I need to think what to give him. Do you think he's into pretty falou? He's into pretty crime. He's just a normal teenager, isn't he? What are teenagers into? Wanking? Jackie! I'm sorry, but they are, aren't they? Right, well, I think that sort of thing's his own business. How long's he staying with you? I don't know yet. <laughs> well, those sheets will be your business. He needs a job, that's a thing. In the absence of national service, keep him out of your hair. Because you're not good with mess, are you, Carol? She's OCDC. <laughs> mm, you're no good when you're anxious. I'm learning to be. Brian Hadman takes on casual stuff. He may have a woman's arse, but he knows how to run a business. Yes. Maybe you could mention it to him, Dad. Oh, he just bangs on about his bloody charity. You ask him. Beverly won't believe her luck offloading one of those kids onto you. It's not offloading. He just needs to be out of town, away from bad influences and... Sponging off you for a bit. He won't be sponging if he gets a job, Dad. I'm going to keep an eye on him. I just... I'm not very up on what teenagers like. Drinking? Music. Girls? Trainers. Burgers? Computer games? Parties? And wanking. <laughs> <laughs> Carol leaves. This is one of your more recent projects. Can you tell us about it? It got filmed, didn't it? It did, yeah. We actually made a pilot of this. Uh, it was a script that was commissioned um, for the BBC and we made a pilot of it with um, Rebecca Front and Kyoji Iwumi playing Carol and Vinny, the title characters. Um, and we had a really brilliant cast and Francis Barber and David Bradley and Amanda Barry. And it was really brilliant people. It was an amazing experience, actually, because it was the first time that something I'd written for telly was actually made in real life and put on the screen with proper budget and you know made in a proper way and it's you know when you're used to having done Edinburgh shows and even radio shows where you're sort of the budgets are tiny and there's not, the team is very small and it's you and a producer mainly or it's you entirely if it's you know Edinburgh shows you know handing out bloody leaflets yourself on the Royal Mile to go from that admittedly over the course of 20 years <laughs> so it wasn't like it was an overnight thing but to suddenly be on a on a TV set where everybody there is sort of asking you questions and there's a costume department who are showing you photos of costumes that you have to make a decision on and there's an art department coming up with props and sets and stuff that you've just scribbled on a bit of paper in your bedroom late at night and then suddenly they're they're all there and they're bringing you eight different versions of that that you have to make a decision on it's like a sort of chocolate box of of wow. sort of excitement and I don't think you would ever get over that excitement actually the sort of thrill of something that you've written and suddenly there it is in front of you with really brilliant actors doing it properly and taking it seriously and, and doing it for a job. <laughs> so, yeah, so we made it and we were really proud of it, actually. And it didn't get picked up by the BBC, which was obviously very disappointing. Um, there's still a chance that it, you know, it's still elsewhere and it may go um, it may go on to become something else. But the BBC didn't want it at the time, which was very, it was sad and it was disappointing. I can sort of see the reasons why now, actually, in retrospect. But there were things I would do differently about it. And that's a learning process. And I think it's a real luxury to be able to sort of make those mistakes and move on from them. And I think, like I was saying about the radio series that I've done, you learn as you go. And there's sort of experience now for radio for me. I sort of vaguely know what I'm doing. But telly, I am still learning. And, and I'm doing several other telly scripts now, which I know will be much better as a result of having made the mistakes on that first thing. But yeah, it's really lovely to to sort of hear a bit of it again and I hope it may have another life in future. Well, a final question. Mm. Are there any offcuts that you've still got that you didn't want us to hear today? <laughs> oh, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, oh, there are hundreds. I mean, like I said before, my laptop's absolutely filled with um, bits and pieces. I did... Um, 
I did toy with the idea. I've never really written a diary. Um, I did briefly as a teenager, but only sort of in a sort of noty way. I, when I was pregnant with my daughter, the first time I was pregnant, I did write a diary and I've never properly read it back actually, but I, um, I did toy with the idea of um, sending you a bit of that, but I've never even shown that to my husband, I don't <gasps> think. Uh, wow. so that would that have been could a end- scoop. I know it would have been a scoot, wouldn't it? And it's probably massively tedious in that way that you are when you're pregnant and you think every tiny detail is fascinating to other people. And then as soon as you're out of that world, you're like, what the fuck are you on about that? I mean, you know, yeah. far less interesting for other people than it is for you at the time, which is absolutely as it should be. So I did wonder about that. And I've got a million sort of early bits of monologues and stuff. And I, I tell you what I did try and find, actually, and I couldn't find is the first time I did any kind of sort of comedy writing accidentally was um, when I was at university. I went to Sheffield University and we had a, I did English, but it it was a a sort of drama module that I always chose. And we had a guest lecturer who came for a term and talked to us. And it was Jack Rosenthal. Yeah, which was really amazing. Actually, I didn't realise quite what a big deal that was at the time. Um, But he came and did two or three workshops with us and sort of encouraged us to write little sort of scenes and stuff and he singled mine out which was thrilling at the time because I'd never thought of myself as being able to write at that stage and he actually was really lovely to me and sort of talked to me afterwards and and I had a very brief sort of couple of phone conversations with him about it subsequently where he gave me some advice and stuff and then he died of course really sadly and and I and I always slightly wished that I'd got in touch with him. And in fact, you know, what? I saw Maureen Lippman on the telly the other day and I said to my husband, God, I really ought to get in touch with Maureen Lippman because I've never met her. But because obviously she was married to him and, and I would love to get in touch with her. And maybe I will actually, maybe this will be the impetus that I need because now I've said it out loud to you. Mm. I should get in touch with her and say to her what a lovely man he was and how, you know, my memories of him are that he was so Aww. supportive. And he really, you know, and he said, oh, I think you've really got something. You've really got an ear for dialogue or you know, I mean, I may have paraphrased him what he said there, but in my head, that's what he said. And so when I ended up doing comedy, I remembered, you know, I sort of thought back to that. And thought, well, I remember Jack Rosenthal said some nice things about about my writing. But it took me another at least 10 years after that to actually do it in any sort of serious way. But um, mm. that anyway. was the turning point or that was but, yeah, the seed well, so that like was planted. Found, yeah. And somewhere in my parents' house, somewhere or in some ancient computer, there'll be a version of that script, which I'd like to have found and didn't. But that would be another one that I would like to unearth one of these days. <laughs> Well, Catherine Jakeways, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Oh, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you so much for sharing the contents of your offcut straw with us. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. The Offcut Straw was devised and presented by me, Laura Shavin, with thanks to this week's special guest, Catherine Jakeways. The Offcuts were performed by Rachel Atkins, Beth Chalmers, Emma Clark, Toby Longworth and Leah Marks. And the music was by me. For more details about this episode, visit offcutstraw.com and please do subscribe, rate and review us. Thanks for listening.